Very good morning to all of you and uh, a warm welcome on this Sunday morning. Today we have a very important and interesting talk that amendments proposed by the uh, Finance Act uh, passed recently. So on this topic we have with us CA Piyush Chatterjee. He will be deliberating on the topic. As we all know, the finance bill was uh, it, it came out on the first of February. The Finance Act has to be passed on 24th of March. So most of the amendments, they will become applicable this year. So I think it's very relevant that we go through all the provisions uh, for, from now on. So to recap on the bill uh, proposals and to compare it with the Finance Act, we have with uh, us, CLU Shadjati, who will be uh, guiding us on the same. Before we start a session, I would request you all to please stand at attention for the interesting Homes Law and the National Anthem. Also, request everybody to put their phones on side for the meeting. Yae Shasupte Shujagrati Yae Shasupte Shujagrati Good morning, everybody. Yeah, Piyush Bhai doesn't need an introduction because he's a sitting central content member with the support of all of you. We all know that. But still, let me give some brief introduction about him. Uh, you know, I'm about his family pedigree, I won't tell you about that. And he's a CA since uh, 2000. No, and he specializes in direct and indirect tax subject proceedings. And uh, he's spoken on various uh, on tax issues on various forums. And as you all know, he's a city Central Council member. Now, in the, as the Central Council member, he's a vice chairman of Direct Tax Committee, vice chairman of Expert Advisory Committee, Deputy Convener for State Development Directorate, member of Disciplinary Bench, member of various other committees. Although he entered late, he is in all the committees. That shows his caliber and capacity. 
and I would care about his uh, accolades in WRC, international bodies, etc. He also acted a, had a very active role in Chamber of Tax Consultant also. And he's with the JP Nagar Board Committee since 2017. He has been author of various books. And uh, as other engagements, he's the independent director in uh, digital companies, honorary board member of uh, GCM, Jane Chartered Fund Federation, acted as honorary vice president of uh, GCM, honorary joint treasurer of Vijay Hemraj Suchi, it is from Ghanaian of Kari uh, Fair. From strongly HCP Badesh in Rajasthan. The trustee of the Varma Jain going for Samiti in Rajasthan and trustee of Devai Memorial Trust and Sri Guru Dane Jain. So, with this brief, I uh, welcome I think, uh, Please Jare for uh, delivering lecture on the amendments made in the Income Tax Act that, uh, 2023. And uh, before I hand over the mic to him, I request uh, our senior member, Mr. Roda and Hemant Gandhi to present a memento to each other. Thank you, Rudaji, and thank you, Hemanji. Now, let us hear from the expert what we, uh, we did read properly or what we just reading in the uh, amendment bill, the Finance Act 2023. Over to Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Haridas Bhai, for your wonderful introduction. Also, thank you very much to our senior member, Lodaji Bhai, for presenting your momentum. Convener of JB Nagar Study Center in this 25th Silver Jubilee year, area, Deputy Convener, Convener Jeta, and the coordinator for today, Simaji, and again, Haridas Bhai. It is really an immense pleasure for me to be amongst you. And as rightly mentioned, I am at Central Council because I am a board group member of the Jamila Jassadi Center. So, Haridas may really very correctly mention that I know, need no introduction in Jamila Jassadi Center because I have been associated with the study center since quite long. It is always a pleasure to be in the study center to speak on direct tax, which I have been speaking since the last six to seven years, especially on Finance Act 2020. Before I go to the topic, I thought it would be appropriate for me because some members mentioned because now I am in part of such a council. Uh, I would just like to brief in the next three to four minutes what are the major activities which are happening at the central council level and at the ICI level. Uh, first of all, I would congratulate this JB Nagar study center for entering 25 years. And I'm sure this year would be a grand under the other leadership of Urvi and Vijeta. And I'm sure the programs, level of the programs will be fit about 25 years of the existence. It will happen like that. Similarly, our institute is entering 75th year on 1st July 2023, along with India. India is also celebrating Azadika Amrit Mahotsav 75 years, coinciding with our 75th year. And it's very important for the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India. During the 75 years, Institute has grown leaps and bounds. As you all know, we are 3 lakh 75,000 members with eight lakh students. And we were the second largest accounting body, but today we are the largest accounting body. It's the biggest, when you compare 180 countries all over, 
today we are the largest body and this is because of the trust and the faith which general public actually reposes in this profession definitely a lot of people do argue that whether the stress has gone down whether the time has changed the trust has never gone down in the profession but definitely the expectation from the profession has changed and therefore it becomes very important for the members as such and even the leadership to meet to that expectation so it is a challenging year 75th year you have to meet the expectations that would be most important and the council is seized of that yes you will have to meet an expectations if you are not meeting an expectation then this trust may continue or not would be a questionable council as part of its 75th year would be celebrating would be doing a lot of events as you know we have 164 branches and 44 overseas chapters with 120 own buildings so there is a lot of programs will be done over a period of year that's one apart second most importantly which uh, would be the upcoming in this year and which i believe would be the launch of new CA course would be coming the new course a lot of to and fro was going with the ministry whether it would be approved they had been to the ministry once then there were certain changes suggested by the ministry not only ministry none other than by the minister of corporate affairs who is none other than the minister of finance also and certain changes were suggested those changes were again uh, came back to the council finally we have been told of course there is nothing in writing today that it has been approved and shortly it will come in the writing also so once it is approved any time, maybe in this year, maybe on the foundation day, we will be able to launch this new particular course. Now, this new course obviously would be reducing your articleship period for the students from three years to two years. So a lot of uh, questions have been raised that why articleship period has been reduced. A lot of people do ask that hey, abhi ne chartered accountant are unki training utni nahi hoti, jo saal pehle hote the, saal pehle hote the. There is a difference. But uh, if you see in these two years, we were doing an analysis that whether you are actually reducing the period of articleship. Well, in three years, you used to get a leave period of 137 days. Plus, exam leave was allowed of 90 days. Beyond 90 days, only 137 may count. Hota tha, otherwise, count nahi hota tha. So, if you add 90, 90 days and add 137, add karte to, to practically three years, mein, six to seven months, so leave pe hi tha. practically. Now, in two years, only 12, 24 days is the permissible leave. So the leave period will go down. And plus he will be appearing for all examination after completion of article shift. So when we did an analysis, so technically it looked like there three to four months ka khali difference. Ho so if he's actually working for 36 months and if you reduce leave and now he's working for 24 months without any leave, so you are actually getting only reduction of three to four months. So we thought it would be appropriate in the current circumstances wherein more of the digital learning is happening. So it would be appropriate. Simultaneously, along with the articleship period, there was one proposal for having a post-qualification experience before you actually take a COP. Now that has not been going ahead with it because the Minister of uh, Corporate Affairs was not in favor of that. And therefore, that has been dropped. Now, after two years, once you are qualified, either you go to industry, you are also eligible for getting a COP immediately. That would be the that is what council has passed. And I believe that is now what will be passed by MC also sooner. Though verbally we have been told uh, through a grapevine that it has been ordered yet. But it has to come into the writing. Uh, at the same time, the course has changed. Like the papers from 8 to 6, 6 papers are coming in. So the papers have been reduced. There is a two self-paced module where uh, the students, based on their convenience, can give examination. So he can read at his convenience during those two years period. So company law and costing two, which are the compulsory self-paced modules have been shifted to the online module where he has to read whole of the syllabus, whole of the law practically, and the examinations have been to be given online. So they will have to clear which will form for eligibility, which will become an eligibility for appearing for the final examinations. So this is the change. Plus, uh, there would be, as I always anticipate that the, even I've been a ch chartered accountant of experience of 23 years. And if somebody asks me any question on Income Tax Act, really, I cannot pursue Finance Act today. Whosoever is practicing in Income Tax will appreciate that if you have a question today, then you can refer to it without the Act to answer it. And you should not do it. I remember Mr. Kanga, who was a senior, he used to tell us, that you uh, he, Gujarati ma, he was a Gujarati gallo, so he used to say, uh, there is no shortcut for opinion. It, we will get the can. It's not like that. So whenever, whatever may be your knowledge, you should refer the act every time, whenever you are asking. You should not rely upon your memory. And in today's time, it's dynamic. Students were actually appearing the examination on memory. 
was the basic difference. When after during our 23 years practice, I am still referring the act without that I cannot answer a particular question. It was too much for the students to mug up and they were actually interested only actually getting a mug up knowledge or fear to appear to us. Jabki used to practical applications. So we are changing some patterns of certain papers where a multidisciplinary case study paper is coming in, which would be an open book examination system. Though open book is there now in an elective subjects, one of the elective. But this would be the one of the major change which will be happening in the one year on the course side. Coming on to the other aspects at the institute, I've been part of Direct Acts Committee, obviously. Uh, as you know, there's a major changes in charitable trust. A new audit report has come, 10B, 10BB. Of course, I personally have not studied much well, uh, but the institute is making implementation guide. And I'm also thankful to Haridas Bhai, he's one of the contributors to that, on which we'll be making an implementation guide on the audit report of 10B and 10BB. So, because if you see the forms, the number of the questions, I believe it is as good as assessment. That's what I've been also told. If you audit report 10B or 10 double B, then there will be no addition. And if that is so, then I'm happy that the amendment has been made. That means there is a trust in our certification. And if I'm giving that audit report, there may be a lot of complications. People are not happy with 10B, 10 BB. This is responsibility. But if the responsibility is executed, if as good as assessment for that particular trust, and if there are no scrutiny or additions, it would be a good move. But there are a lot of uh, issues, controversies in that, how the reporting has to be happened. I believe the committee and the council, once it approves, will come with an implementation guide, which would be recommended in nature, but will help the members while filling the audit report. Our target is end of the June and the CBDD chairman himself, when we met him in the last month, he has agreed that he will release that book and he will also look into it and there would be also comments coming from the department, whether the objective of 10B, 10 B has been achieved or not by the audit processes mentioned in this implementation guide. So that would be the one of the our uh, criteria while we are making and we also propose that after June, this would be converted into a guidance note. Because as you all you know, though guidance notes are recommended, but they as far as the authority of ICI is concerned, those are mandatory in nature because if you are not following the guidance note, you should have a justification for not following, which is not in the case of implementation guide. So the implementation guide would be coming soon and then we'll come with a guidance note. Tax audit revision is a every year exercise. Another important aspect which is happening is a change in the examination committee, uh, digital evaluations. Much of you may not be aware that nowadays our papers of the students are digitally evaluated. Pehle aisa hota tha, kafi complaints aati thi ke certain questions ko answer hi nahi kiya. Ya totaling error tha. Abhi ye kya hote ke jitne bhi exam sheets hoti hai, wo scan ho jati hai. Or scan ho ke hi examiner ko jati hai. Physical copies nahi jati hai. I don't know how many of you are already, there may be some examiners over here. And they have to actually answer, so you would be aware. So you have to answer each and every question. If you are not answering, uh, if you are not marking that particular, giving an uh, marks to that answer, it does not move ahead. And totaling errors will also go ahead. So I believe that this is going well. So that's a, one of the things which has come in last six months and it's going well. And the, the idea behind it is to reduce human errors because ultimately whether I do it or whosoever this, Ultimately, we human errors in the chances of human So, reduce the questions. So, I thought these are two or three important areas which I thought will be. Of course, on the membership this year, though we have become the single largest membership, we have to drive a plan in first July. Se, because there are a lot of uh, chartered accountants who have never opted for membership. And as per our record, there are total 50,000 members. Out of 36,000, have never opted for membership after becoming a chartered accountant. And there are certain members who have not renewed. So, a restoration fee or an additional fee is going to So, we have thought that in 75th year, we will give a waiver. And you invite you please become a member of the institute. Because the, if institute goes beyond 3.75 to 4 lakhs, your number of membership is your strength, which you can showcase to the world. So, these are three or four important areas which I thought I will, before I go on to my subject, I will uh, dealt upon as my responsibility to this study set. Thank you very much. Coming to Finance Act 2023, as uh, rightly mentioned by the convener in the opening remarks, the finance bill was passed on first, uh, finance bill was presented on first of February 2023, after being passed by both the houses, 
uh, president assent was given on 31st March 2023, and it is now in force. So this is in force from 1st April 23. And when we say Finance Act 23, it is forced from 1st April 23. It is applicable for financial year 23, 24, that is previous year and assessment year 24, 24. Uh, in my presentation, I'll try to cover all the amendments in the Finance Act 23. Generally, what we see, there is a lot of differences between Finance Bill and Finance Act also. And most of you would have already now listened a lot of lectures on the budget. You would be already aware on what the amendments has been made. But I always feel whenever you are going through a Finance Act 2023, and this is a study circle, it's not a conference, it's not a seminar. It is always appropriate to rediscuss those provisions in an open manner with an open question and answer session. So we all, even I get my doubts cleared about it. There may be certain areas which I may not have an answer to it. So it's always my idea would be that in Finance Act 2023, though you are discussing, you would have listened to a bill, but it's better to go through it. I may go through, I may only glance through, I may go through quickly. But the important idea is if anybody has any questions on that or any other views on that, please do put forward for the benefit of all the members. That would be my uh, humble request to all of you. There is not major changes between Finance Bill and Finance Act, except two or three years so, and which were much expected also. But sometimes we feel there is a few changes, which is not much the same according to me. If you compare it to the previous Finance Act 22, there was a huge difference between Bill and Act. So there are not much differences. So uh, in my presentation, I cover all the amendments of Finance Act 22. Uh, 2023. Whenever uh, it's a small amendment, I'll just glance through it. We'll be maybe skip also that. And whenever it requires discussion, I'm open to that discussions. You can raise questions at any point of time in between. You can stop me in my lecture at any point. So the everybody knows the first most important amendment was change in tax rates for assessment year 23-24. 23, 24 to AY 24, 25. So, of course, when we are filing the return of income for AY 23, 24, there is no change. This change is applicable from previous year. So, the next assessment year. As you all know, the slabs have changed. From total six slabs, five slabs have been reduced. So the, up to three lakhs, three lakhs to so six lakhs, six lakhs to so nine, nine, 12, 12, 15. So, three lakhs is a gap of each slab with the rate increasing every 5%. Only 25% rate has been removed. I don't know why this was done. I would have been ideal. I would have believed that 15, say 18 lakhs, 25% the flow or above 18%, 30% so the Why there was, why 25% is uh, treated as a step rather. <laughs> so you are moving from 20% to 30%, but that is a law. You are getting quite a good benefit according to me in this. Uh, now what is this? Again, there is, this tax rates have not been changed. Huh? There is a, two regimes have come. We have been used to having a now options. Every thing has option. Chahiye. Just say marketing no that. You have option. Carry a cash back. EMI me lo to yes scheme. Hai. EMI me nahi lo to yes scheme. Hai. Immediate cash payment to five percent. There is option now under the income tax also since last three four two, three to four years. So you have an option. The new tax regime is a default tax. So if you want to go to the old tax regime, you have to specifically opt. If you are not opting for the old tax regime automatically your assessing would fall under the new tax regime. So, if you have to that if you to old tax regime, so you will have to opt in basically. That option has to be done individual HUF who wish to continue with the old regime will now require to opt for the old regime under sub clause C of the Act by filing an online declaration in the prescribed form on or before due date of filing the return of it. So, before filing the return of original, you will have to opt for if you want to go to the original scheme specifically. Of course, the most important, there's an increase in the rebate under Section 87A. I'm just going in very fast because these rates have been discussed, 12,500 to 25,000, because so that up to 7 lakhs, all your income is exempt. So if your income is 7 lakhs, your tax liability would come to around 25,000, which remains exempt. Surcharge, once good change, income exceeding for INR 5 crores, the surcharge applicable was 37% for this particular year. Now it is reduced to 25%. So the all other remains the same surcharge, which is 10, 15, 25, and 37. Now it becomes 10, 15, 25. It remains same. Only 37% has come down to 25%. It's a regular surcharge. Please mind it. There's already a differential. There is a capping of surcharge for certain income about two crores, about 15%. So like the long-term capital gains on dividend income and 112. 
they were not sub subject to the higher surcharge. They had a capping wherein they had to pay maximum surcharge only of 15%. That still continues. This is what is now introduced. A marginal relief is introduced in the Finance Act. Everybody was worried that if I my income is 7 lakh rupees, I was paying nil tax. But if my income was 7 lakh 5,000 rupees, 5,000 kamaya, so tax muja pay karna tha 25,000. So there was a marginal tax relief which was required to be given, which was, I believe, that was not been uh, available in the bill. It has come in the act. So now you have to pay the only difference of the tax. So if your income above 7 lakhs and the tax payable, if the tax payable is higher than the income above 7 lakhs, you only have to pay amount of tax equivalent to income which is higher than 7 lakhs. So if you see this particular chart, I have tried to just compile it in one particular page. My total income is 7 lakhs. Tax liability was 25,000. I get a rebate of 25,000. So I don't pay any particular tax. If now my income is 7,10,000, tax liability was 26,000. Correct? So, but my income has only gone up by 10,000. So I was paying no tax in that case if my income would have been 7 lakhs. But because my income has gone up by 10,000 up, I have to pay 26,000 tax. Now, based on the marginal relief provisions, you only have to pay 10,000. So, this means that the 7 lakh rupees are earned, or the 7 lakh rupees are earned, 7 lakhs 27,000 are earned, they will, after paying tax, remain safe. Because any income above 7 lakhs, up to 27,000 practically will go into the tax on it. It will be beneficial, this marginal relief is beneficial to the income exactly between 7 lakh and 7 lakh 25,000. Because they don't have to shell higher tax and go beyond, below their net after tax income will go below 7 lakhs. This is a small change which has come. Manufacturing cooperative societies, a new section has been introduced. This is in line with the companies also. If you recollect, the new manufacturing companies uh, were given a special rate of 15%. If those companies were incorporated after a particular date and they had to start a manufacturing before a particular date, that was March 23, now stands extended up to March 24 also. But those manufacturing only done by the corporate. This was not available to cooperative societies. Now it is available to cooperative societies. There's amendment rate. There's a new section been introduced, 115 BAE. So if they start the manufacturing activity, but obviously now you have to create a cooperative society on or after 1st April 2023, and you have to complete start the manufacturing before March 24. The process, I understand why this has been given for the one year. The only thing I can understand is this is going to be extended. Here, the society registered for 6 months. Here, the society registration bylaws approve the society registration of the chakar cut. When it will be 6 months, 8 months. So whether you will be able to start the manufacturing activity before 31st March 2024 itself is a post But I believe this would be extended over a period of time. If the societies are formed today, and you start the manufacturing activity as for the period, the tax rate would remain. I believe the intention, the objective of this section for the corporates is also that it should remain in the 15% tax bracket. As somebody asked me a question, 15% kitna saal chalega? Ye, nobody knows. Technically, the way it is drafted, it has to be the 15% only. It should That company should remain 15% only. But obviously, there is always a power to revise the tax rate for that particular section. So I can revise the tax rate for under 115 BAE to 20% also. But the important uh, objective of this is to promote manufacturing over a period of time within five years to six years. And uh, I believe a lot of new companies have been created also. And it has come to a momentum also under... Uh, Make in India also. A lot of companies have come, a lot of manufacturing activity as well, only because of the tax rate, 15%. Also, people have started creating new entities rather than continuing in the same entities. They have done that tax plan. Extending deeming provision to gift to not ordinarily resident. Currently, gifts made by person residents in India to a non residents are deemed to accrue and arise in India under Section 917 of the Act. So what did 918 uh, say? That if you are giving a gift to a non-resident, he has to pay tax. Generally, the non-resident's whole income is not taxable because income is not deemed to accrue or arise. Yeah, but there's a specific provision under the 91 sub clause 8, which says that if such gifts are made to a non-resident, obviously, if it is exempt, it is exempt. 
we are talking of the gifts which are not exempt. It is not to a relative. It should be a taxable person. If it is exempt at 56, it is not taxable. But the question arose, if I'm making a gift to a non-resident, in the hands of non-resident, whether it is taxable or not. So subclause 8 says it would be taxable. It would be treated as deemed to accrue and arise in India. For the non-resident, whatever is deemed to accrue or arise in India is taxable. If it does not deem, if it is not deemed to accrue or arise in India, it's not taxable. But this was only limited to non-residents. Not ordinarily, residents were not. So they thought that this may be a loop. There may be some people who would have taken benefit of this particular section. So they have amended this to now include not ordinarily resident also. So any gifts made to a non-resident or not ordinarily resident also will be. Yes, please. No, no. I'm talking of taxable gifts. So if the gift is exempt per se, then there's no question. Because it's not taxable. Is it? So that income may deem to accrue or arise in income. So how we go? Whether it is income, yes, gift is an income. Whether it is taxable in India, I would say yes, it is taxable. But then I would claim an exemption under Section 56 because it is received and relative. So the hierarchy when I apply a tax provision will so move like that. Uh, again, uh, important provisions, important amendments, a lot of questions coming up on this. Exempt income under life insurance policy. As per the old provisions of 1010D, any sum received under a life insurance policy was exempt, subject to a condition that the premium payable for any year during the term of policy should not exceed 10% of actual capital sum issued. So it should not exceed. If I pay 5 lakh premium or sum assured 45 lakhs, then I don't have exemption. If I pay 50 lakh sum assured or premium 5 lakhs, 5 lakhs or 6 lakhs or 7 lakhs. It was an exempted policy under 1010D on maturity. The amendment made in section to tax income from insurance policies having premium or aggregate of premium above rupees 5 lakhs in a year. It means that any insurance policy issued on or after 1st April 2023, please mark word issued, not an existing policy. Whose premium payable for any of the previous year during the term of such policy exceeds 5 lakhs will be taxable. So if I take a new policy and the premium payable is more than 5 lakhs, then the that policy would be treated as, tax policy, as taxable. That means whenever I receive funds on the maturity, I will not get an exemption under 10 10 day. That would be taxable on that particular day. So when I'm taking a policy, obviously now this policy will not be sold itself unless and until it gets to an HNI um, it, uh, they do not take it for the tax benefit per se. At least there is a deferral of tax today. You are making a premium, you are not paying. There is an accumulation of funds happening. You are not paying tax. So still it may remain a, a good uh, okay, solution when you to look at it from an investment perspective. But if you are looking at it from a tax perspective, it may not be good if your premium is above. A lot of questions do arise on this. Yes, please. That it shouldn't be taxable. Yes, that remains. So, it's, if you could hear the question, he says, uh, I think so, everybody, but it's a very important question. If the maturity proceeds goes to the legal head, then what happens? Premium is above five lakhs. Not taxable. Right. Yes, sir. Such policy means person can take more than one to marry. Yes. Yes. All is exempted. All is exempted. No, not such. That's not the all. So I have come, come. Two lakhs I take, two lakhs I take, two lakhs I take. I take a three policies of two lakhs. Two will be exempt, one will not. So the another question that came. So, so the third policy, you have choice. Let's take an example. I have two lakhs, two lakhs, and two lakhs. So one policy would not be taxable. A question may arise usko 50% exemption de do na. Ek lakh ka boni ho. So if I have a, yes, please, yes, please. you are not satisfied. <laughs> yes. That means the aggregate premium is not exceeded. Yes. This is the wording in the policy. Agreed. The aggregate premium during the financial year is not exceeded. Right. It means that. No, yes, agreed. So aggregate premium in the sense for that particular individual, if those policies put together is exceeding 5 lakhs, 
has not got an exception. The question arises if it goes totally to six lakhs or three policies together, whether I can claim for two of them exemption, two lakhs, two lakhs, two lakhs, whether you can claim for those four lakhs for two policies. My view is you can. My view is you can claim for two lakhs, two lakhs. You will claim for those two policies. For the third policy, you will not claim. Let's take an example. I have two lakhs, two. One second. Two lakhs, two lakhs. Then I have two another policies. Four lakhs, so hogya. I have another policy of fifty thousand. Another policy of one lakh. What should I do? One lakh. One lakh. I'll claim fifty thousand. I'll not claim. But if I claim fifty thousand policy for an exemption, then that one lakh will I'll not be available. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. According to me, obviously it talks of premium, but there are two views in it. For me, it should be excluding GST. It should be excluding GST. GST cannot be considered as a premium. The difference is taxable, right? If the premium is more than five and the maximum is some minus whatever is paid, the difference is taxable. Yes. So I think so. It should be your choice of it. It should be your choice. So if your uh, July youngest are all small, small fifty thousand, fifty thousand, fifty thousand, but you have a bigger policy of four lakhs coming in March, I would claim an exemption for that. Sir, the yes, obvious. No, I want the insurance company will do. If the premium of the single policy is above five lakhs, they will deduct it. Otherwise, they will not deduct unless and until they have a matching. If, if tomorrow, if some circular comes by the CBDT, you can pen numbers ke match them. And if the total premium aggregate of this, but then how will you do? I may have some policies prior to 1st April 23. So I don't think so. So if the single premium of one particular policy is above file, XTDS will be applicable. Uh, I'm not sure on that as of now. <laughs> To calculate tax. Mm. So, so that's why they have come with the TDS provision. So there is already a TDS on the certain policies. So that's why TDS is there. Once the TDS is deducted, then there are if they come with a 10% rate, so okay, 10% is there tax be nearga. If you go up, if you wait up to the maturity, now there are two questions. How would this be taxable at the maturity? I should get a benefit of 5 lakh rupees, the premium. Let's take an example. I'm paying 10 premiums of 5 lakhs over a 10 years period. So it is not taxable, presuming 5 lakhs and 1 rupee, 5 lakh rupees, 5 lakh and 1. I paid 50 lakhs over a period of 10 years. I get 2 crores at the end of the day, along with the all bonuses. How would I do a tax calculation? That's still an issue today also. No, no. No, what I'm trying to say is how would an individual computer tax today? Would you pay a difference of tax between two lakhs, uh, two crores, and 150,000 lakhs? One crore 50 is taxable. Then, what is the value of the money? Is the insurance policy a capital asset? I should do an indexation and then pay tax. Otherwise, the value of money is lost. Then there won't be any gain because because the eight to ten percent you are getting an increment and inflation index is six to seven percent income from other sources. I know, I know, I know. So that's a, that's a, that's what I'm telling. There's no clarity on that yet today. Also, that how would this be taxable? Now let's take an example. My only, I would say it, why I would state it as my view capital asset because. This ultimately amounts are invested in like an equity schemes or debt schemes, which are again a subject of a capital gain law. Ultimately, the if it is not a uh, sum assured, if it is not a tax beneficial instrument, it's a taxable instrument, then it should be taxed as any other particular investments. Yeah. That's why. Yeah. As of today. Yeah. Yes. So, so, the capital asset 
it's a capital asset. So if, if it is a capital asset, you need to say I index 50 lakhs ke premium ko index karu year wise payment ka. Fir sawa karur ho gaya mera cost of acquisition and I pay difference capital gains tax. That's what you are trying to say. So this is a gray area. That's what I'm trying to say. How it would be taxable. If it is a capital gain as rightly mentioned by the member that tax I can initiate because the inflation index is 5 to 6 percent and your returns on the LSE policy if it is between 7 to 8 percent would be hardly anything which so this is the one issue is going to remain. Plus, if that policy is received after that by the legal hand, anyways, it is not taxable. That's according to me very clear because it remains the capital receipts in the hands of those people. There is now this is as you know there was already an exemption charter that if you are sum assured, if the premium is ten percent, then there is so this I just try to make a chart. Let's take a policy A. My premium payable is five point five. Capital sum assured is fifty five lakh. So it's ten percent. Whether premium exceeds 10 percent, no. Whether premium exceeds 5 lakhs, yes. So whether eligible for exemption, no. So I have to do both the tests. What I'm trying to bring in this chart because dono cheez dekna hai. Ab pehle policy E pe jaiye. Mera premium payable hai 4 lakh. Capital sum assured hai 80 lakhs. 10 percent ke andar hai. So it is available for exemption. Premium less than 5 lakhs hai. Available. So I have to fulfill both the columns. Column four, it should be less than 10% of the capital sum assured, and it should be also less than five lakhs. These are the two important points which needs to be kept in mind. This is another way chart which I presented uh, between a different persons, how there could be a difference of a different policy premium. So again, obviously, it is only depicting that both the tests has to be done. The premium has to be less than 10% of capital sum assured as well as less than 5 lakhs. Coming to our next provision now, 10 AA specifying time limit for bringing consideration against export proceeds into India. So 10 AA is an exemption available to export proceeds in India for the export oriented units basically. There are two conditions which have been incorporated now. One is filing a return of income within a due date specified under section 139.1. If you see, a lot of provisions have been amended, wherein it has become a mandatory to claim exemptions of benefit that return is filed within the time. Pele jesa nahi tha, ap Abraham se return kabhi bhi file karo. Return file nahi bhi kiya, to aapko exemption mil jata tha. You see charitable trust. There is also some amendment made. Extending, of course, they have extended in that case from 139.1 to 139.4a. They have given some time. Now, 4, sorry, 139.4. That if it is a belated return, you will still give an exemption available. But if you see it, so it becomes very important as a professional that the, now the returns are filed within the time. If you are not filing a return within a time, there could be a consequences where you may lose an exemptions or the benefits available to that particular entity under the particular law. Proceeds from the other condition is proceeds from sale of goods or provision of services is received or brought into India by the SSC in convertible foreign action within a period of six months from the end of the previous year or within such for, for the period. So there was already a limit available in RBI. The six months is extended by RBI maximum up to 365 days. That is 180 plus 180, 360 days. So if you bring it in that period and if RBI extends it, then exemption will not be lost. One thirty nine sub clause one does not include one thirty nine. No, those judgments I will tell you. This one in relation to capital gains deposit under capital gain account yes. scheme. I believe you are referring to that capital gain scheme at two places. Pause that the whether the amount it only mentions section one thirty nine. If the investment has been not made. In the property, if I recollect that particular section, 139 was niche tha. Lekin aapko investment agar aapne 139 mein nahi kiya hai to investment in the asset, a new asset is not invested within the time provided under section 139. So there it mentioned section 139, and then it said that it has to be deposited before 139.1. It said so. Then it said that because I had not invested in there, there is no limit. It does not say 139.1. So, courts interpreted that 139 1 bhi aega, 4 bhi aega, 5 bhi aega. So, it went up to that. But where well, there's a very specific provision, sub clause 1, I think so, sub clause 1. You have to file it before due date of the return. What, what is it? All exporters, basically. 
the desired export oriented units in a particular uh, location. It's a, it's a very specific locations which are there. Yes. Section 28.4, providing clarity on benefits and sites in cash. Very important amendment this is now. Because this is uh, amendment has been come to overcome a judgment of Supreme Court in case of Mahindra and Mahindra. Section 28 of the Act provides for income that shall be chargeable to income tax under the head profits and gains of business. Clause 4 of this section brings to chargeability the value of any benefit or purchase, whether convertible into money or not, arising from business or exercise of profession. We have discussed 194 R in length. There have been sessions on that. This provision was inserted through so and so forth. Uh, issued uh, and the circular number so and so was issued to explain the provisions of this act, stating clearly that benefit could be in cash or in kind. Therefore, the intention of legislation while introducing this provision was to include benefit of a site, whether in cash or in kind. However, courts have interpreted that if the benefit of purchases are in cash, it is not covered. So, if benefit cash may are here, so 28.4 will not apply. There was a judgment of Mahindra in the Supreme Court. So now the amendment has been made that even if it is in cash or partly in cash or partly in kind or in kind, 28 for me. No, no, no. Um, I think so for this tedious provision, there's a specific circular which clearly says those the, any nature of discounts, trade discounts. Even a special discounts will not be covered. Yes, it should not be. I think so. That circular is on special. It covers special discounts also. It covers that circular is in relation to TDS provisions. When I report, but for being see, there is an issue in that TDS circular also. First, it should be taxable under twenty eight four. Then only the TDS should be there. Then it came to that the payer has, then there's a circular saying that payer ko woh dekhne ki jarurut nahi hai ke taxable hai ke nahi hai 28.4 mein. Because that would have been a long controversy. Because if anything is received under business or profession, whether that is taxable or not, how the payer would know? I am a chartered accountant, I am an auditor. So if I go for an audit and if I get some benefit of purchase side, woh taxable hai ke nahi, woh bank auditor ko, bank ko kaise pata chalega? I may get some gifts, I may get after signing the balance, we do get. So there could be any such scenarios. 35D, deduction of preliminary expenses. It's only clarificatory. Approved concerns report that has been deleted. I'll skip this fast. Uh, very important again. Next, promoting timely payments to MSME. Micro, small, and medium enterprises has been always an important area for the government, even for our institute. We have a MSME startups. A uh, lot of uh, programs we are also doing on that. We have a specific committee for this. So how to promote the uh, MSMEs to grow? So there is a section introduced under section 40, which says that if you are not paying, if any particular assessee is not paying the vendor bills, who is of an MSME, within a time period provided under MSME Act, that amount will be disallowed under section 43. Now, once it is disallowed under section 43, the question arises when it will be allowed. Act says it will be allowed now on the payment basis. So in the year in which the payment has been made, it has to be paid under MSME Act. What does the MSME section 15 of MSME Act says? If there is a written agreement that payment, then it is 45 days. So if there is a written agreement which says that the payment is due within 60 days, then 45 days will happen. If there is a written agreement, it says it has to be paid within 30 days, then 30 days. If there is no written agreement, then 15 days. If there is no written agreement, then it has to be 15 days. So, if you have a payment, you have a written agreement. The question is, what is written agreement? This is an audit question because 43 means always applies to an auditor. Do you report it? You have to do it. But you have to do it. Invoice. Invoice can be an agreement. Every invoice is a bill. Invoice and bill itself is a contract or agreement. There are a lot of judgments to that extent as far as income tax law is concerned. So, of course, invoice, what is the time period? If there is no time period, it's not due. Chartered accountant ka bill mein likhte apan, it's due. Aap likhte ho koi? So, imagine, to aapko 15 days is mein paisa nia hai to, this allow. Aap this allow kar. Now, the question will arise in, let's take an example of a chartered accountant. In our case, we do not provide services also. We do not raise invoice also. 
but the provision is made on 31st March for the audit fees, one lakh rupees. TDA is, is deducted under 40A, 1A, you claim. So what will happen to such? Should we disallow that 43? I am an MSME. Presuming uh, Pius Chajad is registered under an MSME. Act. I am registered. So uh, this provision is applicable to me. The provision has been made that amount payable to Pius Chajad 1 lakh rupees. But I am not raised invoice because I am not provided services. Audit will be done in September. I will raise invoice in October. How would you pay? But the provision has been made. I am claiming an expenditure. It's a due to MSME. Whether this would be. No agreement to pay sir. Some is not payable. So 43B will not apply itself because it is not an it is not a due under MSME Act also. I agree with that. That it should be allowed irrespective. The question is because it is not a due under MSME Act. This is being claimed under the separate provisions of the Income Tax Act, where all the provisions for the on the accrual basis are allowable under Section 37.1 also. If it is on accrual basis, it is as per the regular books, regular method of accounting which you have followed, it is allowable. And if you have deducted appropriate TDS. Now let's take another example. Yes, sir. This says, 43B says, No, you are trying to the provision is made on 31st March. Yeah. So if you pay within the due date or within the period, 15 days, then it would be allowed on the accrual basis. Then it would be allowed on the payment basis. I, I, I just try to take this example. I try to, I'll just... One second, I'll, I'll just go to next slide and show you. So what I'm trying to tell you, let's take an example. You're saying it's due on 5th of April. If, so it would be allowed in the same year. Doesn't matter, you make it in June or you make it, you make it anytime before 31st March 24. It's it's helps. It really does not help that interest. Yeah, you are right, hundred percent. You are very correct. Yes, sir. One second. Hey, boss, mic do now. Yes. It will be disallowed. It will be disallowed. But if 25th March invoice, you pay within 15 days, presuming there is no written agreement, you pay before 10th of April, it would be allowed in same year. But if you are not making within 15 days, it would be allowed in the another year. So let's take, I, I'm just trying to take two examples on this because there are a lot of issues. And this is important from an audit perspective also. In this example, X purchases raw material credit from Buy Limited. Value of invoice, 6 lakhs, 40,000. Date of invoice, 1st Feb 2024. I have written 24 because it is applicable from this financial year. It's not applicable for the audit which we will be doing this year. Date of acceptance of goods, purpose. Why limited is a small enterprise? There is no agreement about the time of payment. Consequently, payment should be made within 15 days of the acceptance of goods as per MSMED Act. It is from acceptance of goods, not from invoice. Deduction will be available to X in a different situations as follows. If date of payment is 28 Feb 24, no question. If date of payment is 31st March 24, no question. As you said, so even if I am not paying within 15 days, within 45, 45 pay within the financial year, no problem. If I am paying 10th April 24, whether it would be allowable? No, it answers your question. Now let's take an example, another question. In this case, because there is no agreement, I extend this. If there is agreement and I have to make a 45 days payment schedule. Then what happened if I pay to 10th April? 45 days, if it's going to happen, then calculate it. If it's going to happen, then it's going to happen. Then it is allowed in 23-24 itself. 
I need not go to the next previous. Year. So then 45 days. You cannot, uh, technically, you cannot have a, such a period. You should not have a period with MSME Act, which is in violation of MSME Act. If it says three months period, 90 days credit, then also you have to pay within 45 days. If you're not paying within 45 days, you have to pay interest on it under the MSME Act. And that interest is disallowable under the Income Tax Act. Yes, sir. Same. So that's an, another example I've tried to take in. Sir, I agree with you, sir. Okay. Sir, uh, now that is between uh, both the clients. What you can do if they are insisting the chamber, how will you change? Sir, but I have seen one thing, sir. I think practically this MSME has not good well. All these multinationals do not agree. They have started doing stopping business with MSME. And MSME, all are keeping quiet. You pay after 90 days, I keep quiet. So, what is it? Then, we say that the auditor is saying that you have to provision interest or disallow it because it's compulsory for as an auditor. So, when I do an interest provision, I shout after one year, why you are not making the payment? Why you are not making the payment? I qualify, I qualify. So, what does it do? I call it. 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 <laughs> so practically it's not happening 100% and if they insist for changing the invoice, it's purely their relationship. Because the problem is MSME is too small to fight with the large corporates. They are more worried to get the business rather than invoking such provisions and taking them for a ride. It's not possible. Yes, nobody does, sir. Nobody does, sir. It's, uh, nobody does. You know, like I don't know how many chartered accountants over here have actually registered ourselves under MSME. Or how many people are doing it? Tell me. We have come here and said, "Sir, I have made a bill on 30 September. You have taken some interest. Why? Because someone has not made a payment in 45 days. Aata hi nahi hai. We are the last to be paid. So do they pay us? Whether we have invoked MSME after being educated and knowing this act very well. So no businessman is practically doing this. That's a different thing. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I agree. Yes, sir. Fully mm -hmm. uh, Can you give a mic? Everybody can listen better. Please ask. So I meant to say, so what you are trying to say that those are not due. All this, all this actually starts from the day it becomes due. As for the agreement, it has to become a due under MSME Act. No? MSME Act does not say okay, you make a payment within 50 days. If it's not due, let's take an example. I make an RA bill. I make an RA bill. But RMS payment is due as per the agreement only after the inspection is done. Engineer is certified in such contracts. Then can I say on my raising of RMS it becomes due and after 15 days I will sue you. After 45 days, according to me, you cannot. Under MSME Act also. So income tax is nothing. The question is income tax says it should be paid as per the MSME Act. If no written agreement, 15 days, 45 days, I'll disallow. But if it is not due as per MSME Act, if there is no default under MSME Act because the due date been later, I think so. Income tax will not come in. This is an another example which I have taken just for the recollections. Yes, Mavinji, please. Are, uh, sorry. This is applicable on thirty days from paper. Right, sir. No, no impact. No impact, sir. No impact. So opening, Opening, no, no impact, sir. No impact. It's only expenses which have been claimed during the 23 24 financial period so on accrual basis. Plan, 
See that now this is a very important role of the auditor, I will tell you, sir. The payment, the question is, see, checks is cancelled after 90 days, it is becoming a scam. No, I agree. There would be a genuine case. There could be a genuine case that he has an cash. Yes. I agree. Issuance of payment. Because I issue a check, I'll take a receipt. I'll put a revenue stamp on it. That matter is over legally. That matter is over. But if it becomes a practice, then obviously auditor has to look into it. <laughs> if it becomes a practice, it becomes the auditor has to look into it. No, but there are sir, sir, there are a lot of other people. MSME me to sir, abhi bhi chalta hai sir, bhoat hai. Yeah. I, I go by his point that a lot of people are doing this. That they make checks on 31st March, it may not be clear. You will keep it in your job for two months. You may present, give him only on the day when actually you want to make a payment. People are doing that. So, of course, giving a check. Getting a receipt of 31st March is sufficient for claiming under the income tax. I can say you that. That's all. So I'll just take this one more example and then we will move forward if there are no questions on this. Invoice value 11 lakh 20,000 of credit from A Limited. Date of purchase 2nd March as per return agreement has to make payment on or before 30th April 2024. You did for payment as per MRC Act is 16th April. So though your agreement says that it is due after 60 days, but MSME will consider it as 16th April. Now, what happens in such case? One lakh paid on 30th March 24. Due date is 16th April, allowable on accrual basis. Paid on 6th April, paid on 15th April. So, any amount paid before the due date of MSME Act will be allowed on accrual basis. If it is paid anything after 16th of April, it would be allowed in the year of the payments. That's also it. The only thing, one check is this, that in this case, if you see an example, which is unlike 43B, you are making a payment on 6 May 2024. That is before filing your return of income. Still, it's disallowable. Unlike 43B, that's the only distinguishing feature. Generally, all 43B payments says that if it is paid before due date of filing the return of income, it should be allowed. But in this case, it would not be allowed. It would be a permanent disallowance. So there would be a case where you don't make a payment for the March purchases or aapka utna hi profit hota. Aapka income hi double ho sakta hai. If you do not make the payments, let's take an example. My purchases are so and all those purchases will be disallowed. If a one month purchases and I am happy to make the payment after 45 days only, and my month's purchase, 12 months purchase would be one divided by 12 as a general rule. If that gets disallowed, so my profits would go like anything. It the margins be nahi hota hai. 8%, 9% kisi ka nets hota bhi nahi hai. It may be 3%, 2% industry. That means for somebody, this is a sale and he is getting a benefit, then the sales will be realized well in time. So it's a one way, it's a benefit. But he'll have to pay tax. There's no benefit in taxation. <laughs> yes. Yes, sir. That is not due, sir. I would say it's not due. It will be allowable, sir. Retention money will be allowed. 10% is deducted from any particular invoice. Sir, that's not due. It does said as I said, first you will have to test according to me. <laughs> Sir, there would be an agreement to that extent, no? That this would not be due, this would be paid only after the final completion, final certification when all performance work has been done. So according to me, it does not become due as per the written agreement. That's all. And the, this is a retention which cannot be disallowed. And I would say I would go further down. What is retention? It's as good as payment of bill made because bill is booked on that particular date and then 10% is again retained towards the performance. I can always argue that way also. 10% hey, 100 pay or 10 wapas 
It's as good as that. Like TDS is always a payment to the vendor. No, even if you do not deposit TDS within a time, it's a payment. Hundred rupees has been paid to the vendor once the TDS has been deducted. Yes, sir. No, yes, sir. Disputed amounts is a due. No, that is that would be disallowed. In any case, it has to be disallowed. आप बाद में finally pay नहीं करोगे तो ऐसे भी क्या allow होने वाला credit balance right back होने वाला है तो आपको पहले ही disallow हो गया of a disputed amount ultimately when you do not pay and you write back that credit balance it would not be taxable now because it has been disallowed under forty three B otherwise it's taxable. Forty four AD. See, no other as per uh, in my view, when you are applying 44 AD provisions, no other provisions of that do apply. No disallowances do apply. So, notwithstanding anything contained from section 31 to section 43D, it comes. So, it would not be disallowed for a assessee who is under the presumptive basis. Usko ye sab provisions nahi lagta. There's a 40A, 1A bhi nahi lagta. And there are judgments to that extent also. There are a lot of judgments to that extent. Because I am paying a deemed income. I'm not calculating my income. I'm not claiming expenses actually. What do I claim expenses? My I may even if I'm a loss, I'm paying six percent of my turnover, treating that as a profit. Yes, there are judgments to that effect. Yeah, of course, I can't say Sujini me wo kya karega uski koi guarantee nahi hai. But there are judgments. Legal position is that it should not be. So 44 AD ADA there's a change in limits two to three crores and 75 lakhs. No other change, so I'll just move. 40 BB and 40 double B, I'll just move Cash to other. Yeah. Cash yes, you see, it is the same, no? It's our, uh, 5%, no? 5%. Yes, 5%. Yes, 5%. Cash receipt should not exceed 5% of. I didn't get you. Then also the limits are available, no? Cash so it's a cash receipt is the one condition from two crores to three crores. Yeah. It has put with an additional condition. So up to two crores, there's no problem. If you have cash, you have 6% available. If you have three crores, you have cash is less than 5%. Okay. So I, I, I just give it faster. Sorry. 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 It has no meaning. 5% cash is generally 2%, 3%. It's a presumption that it is to a retail segment wherein you will have some cash receipts. So if you want to extend, extend. Karo. But I believe they want to discourage cash receipts, obviously. That if you are doing business in digital mode, I'll give you a better limit of free flows wherein you need not require to maintain it. So that could be an idea. But I believe I don't know how many. So, very, very difficult to come in. Ah, sir? Sir, GST ka, GST sir, cash, cash business, GST has come with the guidelines day before yesterday only. So, we are taking an action on the fake billers. There's a specific circular three months ka window open kiya. Yeah, so window open kiya, jaysa hum log amnesty scheme laata na, wajsa unhoonne three months ka open kiya, ki they will have a special concentration on fake billers. So they believe that a lot of hanky pankies are going on. Uh, cash could be one of them. So another alignment, 45-5A with TBS provisions of 194-1C, that's okay. 45-5A is a transfer of capital asset between land or building. Of both case, the CA capital gain will be considered as full value of consideration, shall be taken as same duty value of share and further increase. Kali ek kiya ke bhi TDS ke liye, jo tha, 194-1C, include check or draft or by any other mode, which has been now been included in both, 45-5A maybe. It was only by consideration received in cash, now it has been uh, expanded to include or by a check or draft or by any other mode. If somebody would argue that cash do not include check payment. Yes. <laughs> when they talk of cash, obviously, according to me, it means payments in rupees, whether it's a currency or whether it's a digital. But they have clarified that. Yes, sir. Yes, probably. Or any other mode. 
Yes or any other move? I don't know what's happening on this butters landowners agreement 45A transfer of capital assets. Whether TDS people are deducting or not under 194-1C. If I have land in front of me, I have 5,000 square feet of land. So, I have to cut TDS on 194-1C. Now, any other mode will come. Yes, any other mode will come. So there's a transfer of capital asset. No, there's a transfer of capital. You have received consideration by any other mode. Both conditions fulfilled. So why not TDS? Legally, yes. Legally, no. Section 47.70. Conversion of gold to electronic gold receipt and vice versa not considered as transfer for capital gains. In order to promote the concept of electronic gold, the conversion of physical form of gold into an electronic gold and vice versa by a SEBI registered vault manner will be excluded from the purview of transfer for the purpose of transfer. That's fine. So, my physical gold tha, ja ke vault manager ko diya. they gave me an electronic receipt. That is not a transfer. It's not a taxable transaction. When I sell that electronic receipt, I will get a benefit from the date when I was holding the physical gold. I get an indexation from that particular date. A welcome. According to me, I believe there would be some apprehension raised. Even it would have not been an apprehension, I would have always believed that there is no transfer. But still, it's good to avoid any litigations. Now, this is very wonderful. I know double deductions claimed on interest on borrowed capital for acquiring. Even after being in 20 years, I also didn't realize this. The interest paid on the purchase of the property. We were claiming a deduction under section 24 to the extent available. I'm not going. In. Question arises whether this interest should have been also capitalized in the uh, and claim when you actually sell capital gains. I I never did that. Huh? That's why I, 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 I when I when this amendment came, I learned it. Kaisa ek judgment bhi ko dhungi nikala, aisa kisne claim kiya tha? Somebody claimed and it was allowed, and therefore to overcome this, this provision has come that there shouldn't be a double deduction. You have claimed interest as deduction under 24. That interest cost you want to add in the cost of the capital asset as a cost of improvement. Claim as cost of improvement. And then work out the capital gains will not be allowed. So there won't be a double deduction. So, but this was been done. And rightfully, if it has been done, and government has accepted that this was correct. That position was correct by amending this. If it was not correct position, they would have not amended. There was no requirement for amendment. So by doing an amendment, by stopping double, they have accepted that what was been done by that particular person, whosoever is, whosoever people are there, they have done it correctly. So we also learn over a period of time, that there is such a deduction. Now, there is a of Yes, balance, you have to claim it over a period of five years. No? Yes, yes, sir. So there won't be any double deduction, but it just only talks about interest, no other cost. Yes, 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 yes. Correct. Yes, it will reduce. That's what I'm telling you. So if it has been claimed over there, it will not be allowable as a cost of improvement. There shouldn't be a double deduction in short. Final interest on borrowed capital is claimed in the form of deduction under section. So you are saying all the interest you are talking, there is, there is no mention of principle, the benefit of which you are claiming under chapter 6a. That's what you are trying to. According to me, that should be also not allowable. There are three components. See, see, idea of its objective is that double deduction should not be allowed. Principle, principle. See, we go on a principle. You may, you are right that it only speaks of interest. Uh, so, uh, of course, I, I, I like to look into it. I'm not sure right now. But whether it talks of any interest only or any deduction claimed under Section 24 and Chapter 6. We, we may have to look into it. But if it says, if you say that it's only an interest, then you are right to that extent. Because I'll go by what is written on the Act. Agreed. 50AA, special provision for taxation of capital gains in 
case of market link debentures. What are market link debentures? Now, market link debentures are fixed income instruments regulated by SEBI whose returns are linked to either a particular security or market index, such as government security, gold index fund, or Nifty fund. Current taxability, currently tax as long-term capital gain at the rate of 10% without indexation. Since MLDs are in nature of derivatives, inserted section 50AA to tax transfer and redemption of MLDs as short-term capital gains at the applicable rate. So the MLDs would be now taxable as a short-term capital gain, irrespective of the period of holding. That's all. So it's a full tax rate. Now they have expanded the scope of MLD by the Finance Act. Originally, it was market linked debentures. There was a lot of dispute. What do you mean by market linked debentures? Now, market linked debentures means only listed MLDs. There are certain MLDs which are not listed also. And if you read the explanatory memorandum, it said that it is a listed security. Whereas if you go into the definition of MLD, it may not be a listed also. So there was a one view which was coming. The MLDs which are not listed would not fall under this provision and it would continue to be taxed at current uh, tax regime itself, long term. They have now amended one more. They have expanded the scope also that to these specified mutual funds, which a mutual fund where not more than 35% of its total proceeds is invested in the equity shares of the domestic company. So not more than 35%. Great equity may have. So if it's less than that, it's an equity instrument. Use come hai, to debt instrument ho gaya. So debt ho gaya, to it will be treated as a short term capital gain, a full tax rate. This session applies for the two From 24 25 assessment, yes. So first April 23 24. My view would be from the any new purchases made, not the existing portfolio. And that's why that's I think so. A lot of people have bought also. Paper may put another kafi log name, bitch na bi chalu kar diya. Uske baat ki usko baat mein lagega. But I don't know how much it took off. Uh, the another important provision uh, amendment is section 54 and section 54 F. Now, in short, it's a very simple that the restriction has been limited. The exemption has been limited to 10 crore. Section 54, no problem. I buy one flat. I, I sell one flat. I buy one flat. If the net capital gains is less than 10 crores, I get an exemption. Can I get for multiple flats? 10 crore year flat ke liye, 10 crore year flat ke liye, 10 crore year flat. Jita, jita flat mein kharidu flat, bechu, kharidu, bechu, kharidu, bechu. Sab mein 10 crore ke niche mele ga kya? Otherwise, so 10 crore simple, there is nothing much to discuss. It says cost of new asset should be restricted to 10 crore, sir. Provisio says cost of new asset. So I can have a three new assets. For each asset, I will restrict it to 10 crores. Why shouldn't I not get 54 permits? There is no restriction in 54. In a year, I can sell 10 flats. I can buy 10 flats. One to one match, karo, mujhe capital gain. If I limit 10 crores, I will agree that I will get 10 crores. What do I get? I will get 10 crores. Am I there? Any, anybody has different view? Okay. Now I have bought 500, 500, flat and 600, 600, 600, 600, 600, 600, 600, 600, 600, 600, 600, 600, 600, 600, 600, to decide that 501, 502 is one flat or two flats. And similarly, 601 and 602, which I am buying. One entrance then. So one entrance is one flat, but those are two separate agreements. There are no darwaja to hota hi hai na, sir. Sir, agreement mein do hai, plan mein do hai. Wo to aap kya karte ho, ek darwaja ko bang karke wall banate ho. Generally, what it happens? Ab darwaja ko bang karke wall banare ho aap. But that is actually, as per the plan, there are two flags. What it will be, there shouldn't be a problem. The only problem. Let's take an example. You can invest into a one residential flag, 54 F the board flag. Most time we were always arguing that a uh, uh, includes singular and plural. There was a lot of dispute going on. Okay, with the uh, matlab, if I have one flag, I have four flags, then the judgment will come that a uh, does not mean singular. It can be plural also. And the benefit was done. So this a uh, was replaced with one. 
नो वन मीन्स वॉट सो वन आया तो सबको एक फियर आने लगा कि भाई अभी जजमेंट आएगा तब देखेंगे क्या करना है सो पांच सौ एक और पांच सौ दो मैंने खरीदा तो वेदर दैट इज वन और दैट इज टू विद सेम एंड सो इफ आई गो बाई योर आर्ग्यूमेंट वहां पे मुझे बेनिफिट लेना है फिफ्टी फोर एफ में तो आप यू आर राइट कि तब आप बोलो एक फ्लैट है और आप जब फिफ्टी फोर में दस करोड़ की लिमिट लगा रहा हो तो बोलो वो दो फ्लैट है I agree. What is beneficial to me? I will. There is no specific description. Fifty four says per flat, per cost of new asset. If I can prove, we need to prove it that these are two separate flats. Of course, if it is two separate entrances, the only case available to assessing officer would be that it's a single entrance. That is this. So that could be a little difficult to us. Otherwise, limit is ten crores. Coming to section fifty four F now. Any capital asset. Your cost of new asset would be restricted to ten crores. Everybody knows that fifty-four F may we get a proportionate investment. So if I invest fifteen crores, but the investment would be taken ten crores, so me ko proportionate deduction milega. Abi isme bhi do view hai. Ye mera view is. I may be incorrect. In this. So let's take an example. Amount we invested in residential house of rupees thirteen crores. Net consideration is twelve crores. Capital gains is six crores. Amount reinvested is thirteen crores. Cost of new asset is more than ten crores. So while applying the formula, I have to ignore thirteen. I have to place ten. If I place ten on numerator, denominator pe net consideration a gaya twelve. Capital gain six aaya. So meko proportionate to long term capital gain one crore pe lagega. Something like that. Is that correct? The pura ten crore mujhe milna hi chahiye. So maine ten crore invest kiya. So ten crore ka pura meko benefit do. Mata full six crores do mujhe. Capital gain to six crore taxable for six crore crore. Why one crore will be taxed? Why I should get a proportionate reduction? What does that mean? Now this six crores could be ten crores also. So I should I get ten or I should restrict it to proportion of ten of net consideration. So if I am selling a flat of twenty crores or net consideration of flat, I get ten twenty crore ka le bhi rao. So bhi ab ten crore hi usko pakar ke fifty percent allow karne wale. Is that an intention or I should get a ten crores? So it says the cost of new assets. The problem is it says cost of new asset would be considered at ten crores. Uske upper ka it will be ignored. So I am taking cost of new asset. Then I as a mathematician, accountant, law ko bol jaiye. Then I make formula apply karna. What is cost of new assets? Ten crore. What is the net consideration received? Twelve crore. What is capital gain? ये mathematical formula है तो तो वो deduction कम होना ही है। इस case में छः की जगह पाँच हो रहा है। वहाँ पे दस करोड़ बनेगा नहीं। पूरा अगर दस करोड़ तो it will come down to some amounts. So that's what I am wondering that that could be one of the issue according to me. There is two views in it. I will make it very clarified. That is one person. Somebody is of the view that no, you will get it. So there's another issue to it. I buy a flat of fifty crores. Fifty crores, I have to pay ten crores every year in the installments. Cost of new asset is fifty crores, but I have to pay twenty three, twenty four, March twenty four, me ten crore, March twenty five, me ten crore. So, what do I do? I do I am a H and I. I sell shares every year and generate a net capital gains of ten crores. Every year, I have to claim ten crores. In this mansion, I have to claim ten crores. In one mansion, I have to claim ten crores every year. Can I do that? No. होता है सर इट्स इट्स अ रियल ट्रांजैक्शन आई एम टेलिंग यू इट्स नॉट माय इमेजिनेशन आई बॉट अ 50 करोस फ्लैट इन वर्ल्ड वन और एक्स वन वेयर इज आई टू पे 10 करोस एवरी ईयर और पैसा कहां से आएगा 10 करोस हर साल रिलायंस बेचो किसी के पास रिलायंस है तो रिलायंस बेचता है कोई इंपोजिशन बेचता वैसे ही जनरेट करता है ना जैसे इंस्टॉलमेंट ड्यू है ही सेल शेयर्स एंड ही इन्वेस्ट इट सो व्हेन आई कैन आई गेट 10 करोस इट्स अ कॉस्ट ऑफ न्यू एसेट नाउ कॉस्ट ऑफ न्यू एसेट मींस व्हाट दैट एसेट विल बी कंसीडर्ड वन ओनली जिसकी कॉस्ट 50 करोस डे वन पे डिटरमिन होके 40 करोस परमानेंट इग्नोर हो जाएगा कि जैसे जैसे मैं पेमेंट करूंगा 10 करोड़ मुझे आज टू इयर्स टू इयर्स आई एम आई एम माय कैपिटल गेन अक्रूज एवरी ईयर सर 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 लेट्स लेट्स टेक एन एग्जांपल I am investing ten crores in a residential flat every year, right? Now there is a judgment that it should be completed construction within three years. Let us forget five years; we we'll take three years. 
टेन गर्ल्स टेन क्रोज टेन क्रोज डे वन से भी तीन साल में पूरा था डे टू में भी तीन साल में पूरा था लेट्स नॉट गोइंग टू डेट क्वार्टर आई कम टू दैट व्हाई दैट कैन बी अलाउ बट लेट अस डू इट्स इन थ्री इयर्स ऑल सो टेन क्रोज में शेयर्स तो हर साल बेच रहा हूँ विद इन वन ईयर आई एम इन्वेस्टिंग Within one year, I am investing. In the same year, I am investing because I am actually. What will happen? This ten crore limit will be available for the same flat. Whether I should treat cost of new asset per annum, though the asset remains the same, flat is same, but the cost of new asset for that particular year is ten crores. Capital gains is ten crores. I am investing ten crores, or I should treat the cost of new asset as thirty crores, ignore twenty crores, claim ten crores, or twenty crores will be permanent. Chala gaya sir. Are those by any view? Agreed. So the, it will suffer the objective with which it has been got. I agree to your point definitely. But the cost of new asset. Let's take an example. So it's not incurred, no sir. Cost of new asset is fifty crores. I am incurring it over a period of four years. Sir, there there are contrary judgments on cost of new asset. I I will go to an another angle now. Is that not what was happening? I wanted to claim a benefit of fifty four fifty four F within period of two years. I book a flat of fifty crores. I invest only twenty crores within the period of two years or three years. Fifty crores in one day my capital gain is. Yes, sir. March twenty four. Old provisions. Forget ten crores. And I invest ten crores over a period of three years. Agreement हो गया. Cost of new asset fifty crore identify हो गया. मुझे fifty crore first year में मिल जाएगा sir. Payment में तीन साल पांच साल में करोगे. मेरे को बीस करोड़ ही मिलेगा जितना मैंने दो साल और तीन साल में payment किया. There you say my cost of new asset is what fifty crores or twenty crores to the extent what I have paid. Yes. So you, it should be allowed. In that year also, it should be allowed. I agree. Then your view over here is also correct. I agree. So transfer of property act. Me, so maybe not. 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 पोजीशन नहीं मिलता है ना ऐसा थ्री इयर्स में इंस्टॉलमेंट है ना केपीएच में तो नहीं मिलता है नॉट इवन फिफ्टी थ्री है पार्ट परफॉर्मेंस भी नहीं है कंसीडरेशन अभी दस परसेंट ट्वेंटी परसेंट पे किया यू हैव टू पे पार्ट परफॉर्मेंस आल्सो फिफ्टी थ्री ए से अ सब्सेंशियल कंसीडरेशन पोजीशन समथिंग हैज टू बी सो टेक्निकली देयर इज नो ट्रांसफर ऑफ प्रॉपर्टी हैपनिंग बट फॉर द परपसेस ऑफ 54 यू वर गेटिंग ऑलवेज अ बेनिफिट दैट वाज नॉट रिलेवेंट इट वाज एन इन्वेस्टमेंट ऑफ सेल प्रोसीड्स और अपोर्शनमेंट ऑफ फंड्स देयर वर जजमेंट्स टू दैट एक्स सो कॉस्ट ऑफ न्यू एसेट भी जितना पैसा लगा है उतने गिने जाएगा सर तो ये बोल रहे हैं एग्री ये कंसीडरेशन इज वेरी रिलेवेंट अंडर टीपीए सो देयर इज नो राइट अवेलेबल बट Yeah, even if the right is not available, there's a benefit available under fifty four fifty four F. If you have invested, now you are invested in cost of new asset only ten crores. Your commitment is fifty crores. Ten crores will be paid in next two years. So my worry is that the that cost of new asset would be treated every year to the extent amount invested or no. वो बीस करोड़ permanent जाएगा क्या? क्या आगे मिलेगा? तो ये ये एक बड़ी है. Anyways, uh, difficult to find a solution to it. So According to me, it should be claimed. It may be an aggressive view, but according to me, it should be claimed because the ten crores the limit is a per annum basically. It's a per asset per annum both. It has to service both. If I go by a per asset view, the question is for that particular asset, the cost of in that particular year is only ten crores. 
it does not say it should be a single asset. So when it envisage it should be only one particular asset. According to me, it could be a claim, but it's obviously it's an aggressive view. I'm, I I may give a this. <laughs> A lot of views are being taken on this. I, I'll tell you there are two contrary views. One strong view is also emerging over a period because a lot of transactions are already there in pipelines. If you go into an HNI segment, there are a lot of flats which are 25, 30 crores and they are actually taking that particular view to be taken or not. And obviously, his tax much the way, but the aggressive view later. <laughs> to be very fair, he is going an aggressive view for that. Now, Sometimes nobody, we never expected that a would be read as plural. It was that time it was interpreted it's a beneficial section. A landowner who part hajar square feet milta, abhi uka residential flat, usko benefit diya hua hai, Madras High Court. A landowner surrendering a land in a redevelopment, getting 25,000 per square feet, he got a benefit of 54 or a 54 app, whatever it is. So, so it's a beneficial section always interpreted liberally. That's what is my view. So, any other questions on this 54 54F? We'll go ahead. Yeah, questions 54 54F. There are a lot of controversies on this. 552. There is an old judgment because we are in Mumbai, it's very relevant for us, section 55. All these societies have been redeveloped. When I was building in J.B. Nagar, I saw that every building was redeveloped. The one that was not left, that was also going to be done. So, we got all the additional area. When the additional area is getting, that 500 square feet, I got 700 square feet. So, there was a case on the case of society, Bombay High Court's judgment. This is not a taxable. Why this is not taxable? That I got this additional area because of change in development control rules in 1991. That is by operation of law. There was no cost associated with it. 200 square feet additional is because of change in DC rules. It is a nil cost. And there was an old judgment of Supreme Court, uh, some BC Srinivasa, that if the cost is nil, cost of acquisition is nil, capital gain calculation mechanism fails. And therefore, it is not taxable. We were all taking a protection under that number one. Now, the question is it says, now section 55 says, that for this purpose, the cost shall be treated as nil. It includes capital asset being any intangible asset or any other right. So this is a right. A right to additional FSI is a right. It is a capital right. It is a capital asset. If the cost is nil treated, if there is no cost, then it used to fail. If it is nil now, that means it's a zero. You reduce cost of acquisition and then there would be a taxability may arise. That is what an apprehensions are being raised. Now, there would be an, another side of this. You are already. So, there is an another aspect to it. Now, if it is taxable, obviously, there is no issue when it comes to a residential flat. You have section 54. Mil jata hai. You can file a return 54. There is no limit on number of flats. Instead of flat, you are getting a flat. It's always better to file the return of income as if the capital gains have occurred for 500 square feet. I've reinvested into a 700 square feet. Consideration and investment will remain the same amount because the consideration is equivalent to new flat. That's how you determine it. That's, so there is no problem. But in the commercials, because of 54 and 54F is not available, technically, that would be an issue to it. So that could become a taxable transactions. That's what it seems to be. Yes, please. According to any other right, is it right? Any other right now, the cost would be nil. So that would be a taxable transaction. The whatever benefit 54F you will get. I'm not on to the first is whether taxability arises or not. For tenancy or tenancy, there was an amendment made which said that tenancy rights would be treated as a nail cost. But there were much more other rights. So this is the FSI, which has been created by operation of law. There was no provision for that. Now, by including any other right, I think so all and everything would be covered. Yes. 
Yes, because there's no benefit of 54 available. So if you don't want, or you want to still go and still treat the nahi, any other right, bhi nahi hai. it's not any other right. Mean any intangible asset or any other right. So it should be read with intangible assets or similar. It cannot be the right which is derived through operation of law. That one can argue uh, it's a far fetch, but it could. Commercial, so you are not getting 54, no, sir. 54 of my investment residential flat, man, sir. No, if shop ki jaga shop mil raha hai. Shop ki jaga ghar mila to 54 of my. Yes, sir. Shop. And now the. <laughs> I'll just move to the next provision, very important provision. 56 to 73, my favorite in fact, to eliminate the possibility of tax avoidance. 2013, for the first time, a provision was made in 56 to that is other income. If you are receiving any shared capital along with a premium, which is an over and above the fair market value of the particular shares, it was taxable. And this was brought in because a lot of people feel that capital formation ka kaam chalta hai. Kalkata, Ahmedabad ki kamni hai, Ahmedabad Bombay mein aati hai. <laughs> so all this to uh, curb this minutes, this provision came in. But there was a provision was only applicable to a resident. So if the consideration was received, if your shareholder or the proposed shareholder was a resident, it was applicable. And to best of my understanding, non-residents were purposefully kept. Not because there was a logic to it. Yeah, two, one, Non-resident had a restriction under the firm. Foreign Exchange Management Act says that if my investor is a non-resident, I cannot issue him a shares below fair value in any particular case. It has to be a minimum. Pellet DCF tha, abhi any internationally accepted valuation value. So agar uski 100 rupiah ki share ki value hai, to mein usko 99 mein issue nahi kar sakta. To 100 ki value to mujhe 101 mein karni hai. So, FEMA used to say it should be higher than this. Income tax says, sorry, so value saw it 99 low. So, it's a contradiction. And I used to believe that this was, that's why the legislature, after understanding the whole gamut of this particular provisions, had kept non residents outside. But I don't know now the times have changed. Non residents have been. So, any investments coming from a non resident, it may be a fund. It may be a startup fund. There are a lot of American funds which are investing into India, into the startup companies. It is from Mauritius. It is from UAE. Any particular fund, invest into that. If the valuation is above the fair market value determined as per such rule 11 UAA, now it would be taxable under 56.27b. But the rigors will, I will not say taxable. The rigors of 56.27b will be applicable. You will have to prove that it is at the fair market. Now, this is in contradiction of FEMA, according to me, and this should not have come in. It should have been actually because a FEMA says you have to bring a FEMA is happy. Why you have foreign currency is coming in India over and above? So if somebody is bringing, let's presume for time when it's a black money. It's my own money, which is rooted through somebody else. Then also ultimately the foreign exchange is coming back in India. Now, the only way I could look at it, it would be a counterproductive. Now, no one will come. Sit down. One will not come in capital. If it comes in capital, it will be in the business. It will be in the India. And foreign currency is coming to you. It may be out of 100 investments happening. There may be a 10 which is only a, again rooted. It may be. I am not saying. But purposefully, this was kept that if the value is high, if the foreign exchange is in India, then come to come. Let Indian companies be valued higher by those non-resident investors. But this has come in. There were judgments to that effect, wherein these questions were uh, disputed, one of this which I could find. Actually, and there were many more. And the tribunal went into this logic that why purposefully non-residents have been kept as well. This is the reason that let foreign exchange at the higher value come in in India. That is more beneficial to India. And as we know, RBI Act overrides income tax act. To certain extent, wherever applicable, notwithstanding, RBI Act actually overrides income tax. So if I am not violating FEMA, and if RBI is approving the valuation, still whether 56 to 7 we can be invoked, this would be now a litigation point. 
In the valuation, I take a prior approval. Let's presume there are two routes, automatic route, approval route. Automatic route also RBI approves it. I can always argue. Though there is no argue, it's, a, it's, a, it's only an intimation. But there is an uh, approval route wherein they actually approve the valuation. Now the valuation of 100 rupees face value is valued at 500. RBI is approved. Whether income tax can come and say, sorry, aapki valuation to 200 rupees hai. Because income tax officer to aamare kutke projections ko bhi reject kar leta. Wo khud, he becomes a businessman. Nahi, yaar, sales bhoat jada hai. I don't know <laughs> how he knows that sales jada hai. Or he becomes a businessman. Though, cabinet says that you can't become that. If it is not glaringly wrong, or if it has not been achieved, still you can follow that. So this is the one provision which may have a long impact and litigations. Relief to startups, uh, fine, uh, this I will just skip it. Reducing time provided for furnishing TP report. This is very specific to transfer pricing. Uh, within 10 days, you have to report rather than from current 30 days, which can be extended. This is during scrutiny. You have to, they may submit documents in relation to transfer pricing. We call that uh, uh, economic study report, which includes all the documentation as per 1010. Excluding assistance to authorized officer, just expansion. I'll just try to whatever uh, feel. Yes, section 142A, preventing permanent deferral of taxes through undervaluation of inventory. Subsection 142A of the IT Act provides that in case the AO has doubts about the correctness of accounts, multiplicity of transactions in accounts, or specialized nature of business activity of associate any stage of proceedings in regard to the nature and complexity, volume, and in interest of ways of opinion, it is necessary he may with the previous. This is a special audit. In short, new amended to amend the state subsection 2 to enable the AO to get the inventory of assessee also valued by the cost accountant. So under 142A, they have also taken a power to get the inventory value. Well, a special audit karate, if there were complexity in the books of accounts, now they can also get the inventory value from a nominated cost account. Now I agree the inventory value karoge, uske baat karoge kya? Can you make an addition based on the difference in inventory? Let's take an example. My inventory is 100 rupees and the one valuer is appointed at 142. He says the closing stock is 150. Can you make an addition of 50 rupees? There are judgments. That this is nothing. If you have to do it, if you have to tinker with closing stock, please tinker with opening stock. If you tinker opening stock, closing stock. So this is nothing. It's only purely so what is happening is there is no permanent difference. It gets reversed in the next year. So if my closing stock is lower, then obviously expense opening stock is an expenditure, which is also lower. I'm not taking a benefit. So I don't know what will happen, but power lena the lelia, lelo, Alignment of timeline provisions, reduction of the period to nine months. Facilitating TDS credit for income already disclosed in return of income of the past year. So what happens is, as you know, credit of TDS can be only availed in the year in which return is income. This is the biggest problem of their professional square actually. We book income in the book and TDS, to, I don't know how do you handle that. Fortunately, there are no cases. So, but the income and the TDS has to match in the year. And if you realize later on that the income was offered in the previous year, you can now apply here for a rectification. Those specific facilities of there. Otherwise, also technically rectification should have been done. So, if I'm not getting a TDS in the next year because the income was already offered for taxation in the previous assessment year then I should actually get a credit by way of rectification under 154, which was technically not, but now this will support this. Yes, sir. You can carry it forward. That's all. I'm talking of the other year, other way out. Income is offered in previous year, TDS is coming in the next year. So, you carry forward, you have to carry back. Carry back, you have to carry back. You have to carry back, you have to rectification, you have to apply, you have to claim. See, he would say, I would rectify what is claimed in return of income and there's a mistake apparent. You have not claimed. How can I apply a fresh claim now? So this is a fresh claim which is allowable, which is a good provision. Yes, sir. But what happened if he gives the same assessment here and he, he, he in the return, he gives the assessment year 23, 24. So, I do problem. I delay in 26 years. problem is that he gives the assessment year. The new assessment. So, this is
This is interesting now. 206 C, increasing rate of TCS of certain remittances. As you all know, TCS had come in a year before. Uh, and uh, any overseas tour package, I mean, I have to TCS collection. Tomorrow I was on airport, sub families bar jari. Only we all are professional sitting here. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so rate under old law, 5% without any threshold. Now it's 20% without any threshold. I don't know why it has been increased to 20%. Now the, the, there is a lot of issues in this as far as implementation is concerned already. Now 20% is quite high. I'm sure this will nothing but it will attract. Nobody is going to pay. It will attract more black money. Or possibly they will arrange a transaction in a matter of Japan and foreign currency pay karu, or foreign may settle karu. or ya, ya pe tickets, airline ka tickets ka payment airline ko do, hotel ka payment hotel ko do. So I don't know what it will be achieved. They are feeling agar ek rupiya bhi aaya, so they can keep a track of record that who is flying abroad. Because they feel if person is flying abroad, that means he has a great income. He is a super banker. Ye nahi pata, log aaj loan pe bhi jate abroad. <laughs> you have any EMIs for all this uh, package suits. Yes, yes. No, that's uh, the Honorable Prime Minister one day said that people are having so many Mercedes, but he does not pay tax. But when I when I went when I applied my my yes with the Mercedes, they state of tax me, but the first year is not deduction depreciation. Tax will be increased. How will tax be increased? Mercedes will not be taxed. Then he will loan pay. So his interest will be deducted. So tax will be paid. I like it. So rest are all your uh, procedures. I will just keep on this. Charitable and religious trust, very important. Of course, I'll just briefly do it. It requires a whole session on it. And uh, there are some important things which have come. Repayment application by a charitable or religious trust before 1st April 21 out of a corpus loans or borrowings shall not be allowed when such amount is deposited back or invested in corpus or loans or borrowings is repaid. Repayment of loan or investment deposit back into corpus shall be considered an application of charitable or only within five years of application. I have no money, I have given the corpus to utilize it. If I replenish it in five years, I will replenish the corpus to corpus. It has to be done within five years. Then it would be allowed as an application, otherwise it won't. Donations by a trust or institution to another trust or institution shall be treated as application up to 85% only now. Rahul Gandhi has banned the trust from Rahul Gandhi. Trusts and institutions have commenced the activities shall make. These are again the procedures, important provisions. Third point, provisions of accredited tax under section 115 TD are extended to trust or institutions if they fail to apply for re-registration. What was happening is, if you are a charitable institution, the provision came, this was last year or maybe a year before, and you are not becoming not charitable now. So you are becoming a regular business trust. So, jitta bhi aapka accumulation of accredited income tha, that was becoming taxable on that day. So, fine. That was a CEO motor decision taken that I am a charitable institution. Now, I don't want to be a charitable. So, I'm becoming a non-charitable. I'll do a regular business activity. Jitta mene income accredited kiya, or uska benefit liya section 11 mein, uske upar tax pay kiya. Abhi ye extend kiya ki agar aap re-registration apply nahi karte ho, aap bhul bhi gaye. So, because now registration is every five years. You have to apply whatever is the procedure, provision, final, whatever it is. You have to apply. If you are not applying for a re-registration within time, I would say, then these provisions will be applicable. To claim accumulations of income, trust or insurance shall file from 9A and from 10 at least two months before the due date of filing. So due date, for example, September, so you will have to file on 31st July. हम तो सितंबर में पहले वर्किंग करते हैं फिर जाते हैं कि रेजोल्यूशन भेजो एस्पेक्टेशन बनाओ फिर फॉर्म 
टाइम सेल होता है अब वो नहीं चलेगा तो जनरली यू विल हैव टू वर्क इट आउट बोर्ड मीटिंग विल हैव टू बी कॉल्ड रेजोल्यूशन शुड बी इन द प्लेस एंड यू विल हैव टू फाइल फॉर्म 10 अकॉर्डिंगली फॉर्म 10 इज टू बी फाइल्ड बाय द एसएससी दैट व्हाट इज माय एक्युमुलेशन व्हाट आई एम एक्युमुलेटिंग ओवर अ पीरियड ऑफ 5 इयर्स दे हैव टू फाइल प्लीज माइंड इट नाउ देयर इज द स्पेसिफिक पर्पस पहले हम लोग मेंशन करते थे फॉर्म 10 में कि जनरल पर्पस इसी के लिए भी यूज करो अभी इट सेज के इट हैज टू बी अ स्पेसिफिक पर्पस so if you are saying medical medical if you are saying education it has to be education it should be utilized hitherto so we were also actually following fifo basis ke ye saal ka kharcha agle saal mein ho gaya aur ye wapas accumulate kiya so ye 5 saal kabhi pura hi nahi hota tha it's never was happening but now when it is for a specific purpose it can become difficult because that specific purpose may not be available in that particular year if you are saying education or koi education ka expense nahi hai tab to difficult but just there are many more uh, this i will go ahead 149 time limit of nurses yes sir in next year sir 149 time limit of notice as you know the search proceedings are now also covered under section 148 153 is not applicable agar search aaj hua for example today uh, in last week of march so they can issue the notice only for the 3 years up to 50 lakhs up to 10 years तो दर में भी सिचुएशन के सर्च के टाइम पे मटेरियल मिला एंड थ्री इयर्स आर एक्सपायरिंग ऑन थर्टी फर्स्ट मार्च ट्वेंटी सो इफ द सर्च हैपेंड ऑन फिफ्टीन मार्च ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी थ्री थर्टी फर्स्ट मार्च ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी थ्री सर्च इज असेसमेंट इन नाइनटीन ट्वेंटी यू कैन नॉट इश्यू एनी वन फोर्टी एट नोटिस अंडर द न्यू प्रोविजन फॉर एवाई नाइनटीन ट्वेंटी आफ्टर मार्च ट्वेंटी थ्री एंड सर्च इज हैपेंड ऑन फिफ्टीन मार्च सो टू कोडिलेट इन्फॉर्मेशन इट बिकम्स डिफिकल्ट सो वट देव सेट दिस फिफ्टीन डेज शुड बी इग्नोर्ड If the search happens after fifteenth of March, the fifteen days period should be excluded for the purpose of limitations. So notices issued after that would be treated as valid for reopening AY nineteen twenty. Otherwise, it would have been time barred on thirty first March. I think so. It's a fair. Obviously, if you are searching and you are on thirty first March, you are searching and you have data. <laughs> नोटिस इश्यू करने भागू और उसमें रीजंस भी जुडिशियली होना चाहिए उसकी एनालिसिस भी करूं सब करूं तो I think so. That was not fair. similar in case of survey sanction is of course they have expanded the scope principal chief commissioner or now also includes chief commissioner written in response to notice issue under section 148 now this is a clarification we have been arguing very important point again amendment says when written is filed beyond the time limit so section 148 ke aapke paas notice hai hamara hamesha ek argument rehta tha ki it has to file a return within 30 days period If we are not filing within thirty days, we used to say it's still a return under a return file in response to one forty eight is a return under one thirty nine one. If filed within the due date, so if the return में date थी तीस दिन में file करो हमने file कर दी तो one thirty nine one का return आप treat करो इसको. It's very important why because this affects your penalty provisions. One thirty nine one का return. अगर मैंने delay file किया तो delay date समझो one thirty nine four. But it's a pure motto filing. And what you are assessing is the return under one thirty nine one. So we always used to argue at the time of the penalty that this is a there is no tax evasion because I filed in one thirty nine one. So if I offered any differential income while filing a return in response to income, it should not be subject to tax liability. Now they have come with a provision that if it is not filed within a due period beyond the time allowed, it will be treated as if it's not a return under section one thirty. तो जहां जहां पे भी 139 थर्टी नाइन की आप बेनिफिट क्लेम करने की कोशिश करोगे वो अवेलेबल नहीं है सो थैंक यू वेरी मच बिफोर आई डिपार्ट विद दी यस प्लीज लास्ट क्वेश्चन नॉट रिक्वाइड रिमाइंडिंग मी and uh, it's also very important from a council perspective because council is also sees of this matter that whether this is extending the scope of chartered accountants whether chartered accountants are at the rescue pml ka naam aate kaam kare it's it's because we are now dealing with enforcement direct for it 
PMLA is governed, administered by enforcement director, unlike income tax officers. Though ED initially used to be an IPS officers, now they are all IRS. They are all transferred from our own uh, investigation wing or maybe the regular assessment. The, why did this come? This was a recommendation of financial uh, task force, basically, which the international is saying that uh, there are little problems as far as creation of the company in the concern, and we are not able to take action on those chartered accountants or those professionals, even including lawyers. When FATBF gave their report, it included lawyers also. Hey, you should include all the professions because somewhere they are involved, but law is not helping. So law should equip us to take an action in case of wrongdoing. Because if wrongdoing is in actual me could not operate the company in money laundering, so to scale the power to change a government action. Such wrongdoers should not be whether is a professional, then professionals cannot go out by just saying that I'm not a person covered under it. I'm not a reporting entity. So I should not be covered in it. So to bring in that, this has come. Now this are very there is also one more background to it. If you remember, there is was an issue of this Chinese companies, fraudulent Chinese companies came. If Chinese companies with the ROC cases open way on the chartered account, I'm giving you the clear facts what has happened because I'm part of that discipline. A lot of cases happen on the chartered accounts, stating that this all chartered accountants opened help them in opening this dummy companies, all these Chinese companies, and they have done fraud, loan frauds, whatever the frauds they have done, and they were covered under PMLAs. All companies, chartered accountants, they against my PMLA, like me, to. They were not covered by PMLA provisions. That was also one of the reasons. But they initiated disciplinary cases. It came before the council, before the disciplinary committee also. Okay, these are the chartered accountants who have certified INC 22. If you recollect when you open the company, we give a certificate under INC 22. Generally, we do give it in a very casual manner sometimes. INC 22 says that I have physically verified the registered office. To read the language, please, one second. I physically verified it. The directors have come and signed in front of me, before me. They have signed. So these are the two certificates which were given. In the majority of such Chinese companies, when those chartered accountants were called, obviously they can't lie, obviously, because the person chartered accountant is from some small rural village of Karnataka. Directors are from Bihar. Companies registered offices in Gurgaon. How you could lie that? He could not do that. He said he agreed that. In, and the actions were taken with that. But the government was always feeling that they were not purposefully. Though they were not purposefully, their interest was to create the company and forget it. It was only a casual approach. So that was one of the reasons which also government was also banned. That why it should be brought in now. Anyways, there is an international pressure, but also it should be brought in now also because there are a lot of other circumstances. Two, government is also expecting. He, just an engineer, ne agar commencement certificate diya is billing ka, to wo billing gini nahi chahiye. Okay, I certified that this pillar column is proper, hai, to, to ye gir sakti hai. so they are expecting as a chartered accountant, as a professional, if you are certifying something, their expectation today is that everything is fine, so at least on that particular day. It is not that they are expecting that I have a fraud, I have an export company. Ki. Open. I remember, if I open an export company for export of the goods and somebody exports some chemicals which is a bad atom, how can I be responsible? That is not that. Though the words used are creation of entity, but the creation of entity for the purpose of PMLA. So if your objective is what we are doing it at the institute level, we are planning a particular uh, sessions on this and also some advisory would be coming in. Yes, the engagement letters abhi sabko lena hi chahiye. Not only auditors. We are taking engagement letters only for the audit, not for other works like income tax. When I'm filing a return of income, it's important that we take an engagement letter. That he has disclosed all the facts before me. He will not disclose it. And then he will say that I have told you that there is a foreign bank account. So engagement later should be very clear that he will not indulge into unlawful activities in any PMLA activities or so and so forth. We are redrafting that particularly for all areas, whether it's a GST compliance, income tax compliances or whatever. That would be the one of the areas which is you would be doing it. So I don't see much worry to it. Obviously, but yes, when PMLA comes, can't carry out that. Can't just carry out that. Because they will not answer. They will not understand. 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 They
sir, I, I, to my knowledge, sir, uh, this is not uh, lawyers. Generally, obviously, the lawyers ka possibly cartel is strong. And lawyers always claim that they never represent clients. Sir. The most important. They say they are the officer of the court. And when we, like, if I'm there, if I'm appearing in the tribunal, I also do that. I always say that, okay, sir, my work is to facts. Ka. Decide to do it. Now, I don't have to decide to do it against me. I don't have to do it. I would be doing injustice if I'm not bringing all the facts, all the judicial precedents. That's what lawyers say. My duty is to bring out the facts, all the mistakes done by the officers, all the judicial precedents. I'm not defending my client. I'm the officer of the court. That's what their definition is. Agreed, agreed. Sir, if you may recollect all those agreements which were drafted, of course, no action was taken and because of their lobby, they have not been drunk. If you remember when the DHFL was in PML action, one of the very big law firms was here. Very big law firm. But obviously, they also could not brought it. I will not name it. A very big law firm because all agreement draftings for the documents, for the papers were done by them. And they had a search also. All their offices were sealed, documents were taken over, everything was taken over by them. So that is how it was. But lawyers have lobby process. I also recognize the uh, presence of our uh, past Central Council member, Sanjay Maheshwari ji. Sanjay ji, yes, sir. You can see it sir. Yes, sir. So, Maybe, sir. So I'll just end my session. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. I hope I have done a bit to explain why our position is better than my other. Thank you. Thank you, Kushi. It has been a, a by the sheer strength of the house today, and uh, that people are willing to sit and uh, listen for such a long time. It shows uh, how wonderful your session is. And uh, to propose a formal vote of thanks, I would like to invite our deputy convener, Sivita Jaiswanji. Also, after that, we'll uh, take a break for snacks and assemble back in 15 to 20 minutes for the second session speaker are already here. So, uh, we'll start early. Okay. Thank you, Puri. The income tax amendments are so many and in number, they are varied and complicated. And so we as professionals are constantly seeking clarity. So, mana ki andhera ghana hai, par diya jalana kaha mana hai. So, PUG has certainly lit a bright lamp through this extremely informative sessions with detailed charts and examples. And obviously, we all have been a very live audience with uh, good question answers. So thank you, PhD, and the audience, the coordinators, Haridas, Bhatt, and Sima Mehta, both are past uh, conveners of our study circle, the management and staff of Goenka Hall. And uh, I would uh, request a round of applause as a vote of thanks. Very, very short break of 15 minutes. Please reassemble. Thank you.